That's a Charles Wesley hymn. One of the things you can always know about Charles, Charles Wesley hymns is in the last verse, you always go to heaven. That's always true in a Charles Wesley. So we should sing more of them so we'll all go to heaven, right? Amen. <laughs> so today, the scripture reading, the first one, it comes from Proverbs. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great. For it's better to be told, come up here than to be put lower in the presence of the noble. We'll hear a little what Jesus says about that in a little bit. Friends, as you're able, would you stand again as we do our affirmation of faith this morning, a modern affirmation. We believe in God. Infinite in wisdom, power, and love. Whose mercy is over all His works. And His will is ever directed to His children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ, and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love, as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. singing every time I feel the Spirit. And if you're led to come forward and pray, feel free. morning, we certainly want to remember Mac as he continues to recover at home uh, and others that are dealing with all kinds of physical and other ailments, our community and the world. Let us pray. Gracious God, this morning as we gather to worship and to praise you, we come into this place with many things on our minds. Concerns for family and friends. Concerns for other people from our church. 
concerns for all of those that are experiencing hardness and suffering in their life. As we try to put ourselves in their shoes, we recall your words where you said you would be with us always. Maybe, God, they don't know that. And so as we have the opportunity to talk to others, to share our faith with others, let us remind them that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the same today as He's always been. And He has already promised to be with all of us forever. We pray for the church. The big C church, all churches. Sometimes we used to use the word God, we were calling for revival. But in so many cases, it's not a revival. It's a first time revival. We pray for churches to be able to reach out into the community and be the heart and hands and feet of Jesus Christ. We pray that the things that separate us from our brothers and sisters in other denominations become less important than our Savior Jesus. The actual face of God that we've had the opportunity to learn about and study. The ways in which He gave us commandments that were really simple commandments. Love one another. Love the Lord God with your heart and your soul and your mind. God, forgive us when we put limits on that love. Forgive us when we isolate and say that we've got a better idea of God than somebody else. Raise us to new life. A life that allows for the world to find a way to come to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Even if it's through us. Sometimes, God, we doubt we know the disciples doubted. Sometimes we don't understand. We know at times the disciples went to Jesus after He had done something or the other and said, what did that mean? And we find ourselves in that same place looking out at the world and saying, what does it mean that Jesus Christ is Lord? Is He really Lord of my life? When I ask Him, Lord, how do I pray? And when the disciples ask that, do we really want the answer when He says, pray like this? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In just a few minutes, I'll be inviting the ushers to come forward for the collection of our gifts, tithes, and offerings. Just a word about what we're able to do here at the church lately is, of course, you know, earlier in the year we supported Bill Nash with uh, 11 children to go to Champions Kids Camp. We continue to feed our family in the neighborhood with our blessing box. And we are grateful for everybody's participation in that. And of course, we are thankful for the support you give our church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, your tithes, and your offerings. At this time, I invite the ushers to come to the front. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to live our lives in this place. We're thankful that we have something to share. And God, we trust that when we share it with you, you will use it for the purposes of glorifying God in this community and in the world. So today we ask you to accept our gifts, our tithes and our offerings. Take them and use them to magnify and glorify the name of Jesus Christ in this community and around the world. Amen.
pleasure and worship you please stand. Praise God and all the attention this last week of some people that I know that are watching us online every week and uh, the way that works in case you're not here and you want to know this service will be shown later today it, they're not live uh, they happen later in the same day but Saturday night's already on there and uh, what I'm suggesting to people is that if if uh, and this is for you guys that are watching online make a comment let us know you're there so we can pray for you if you have things to pray for and so forth and so on I I know, I know how many it is. The number varies around 20 or 25 different uh, engagements, they say. And I know a couple of the people that like the Saturday night music better than the Sunday. And I know a few of the people that like the Sunday music better that they don't really differentiate too much in the messages, although they are quite different and usually on different scriptures. So just be aware that we are amidst a cloud of witnesses and they, they're experiencing this wherever they are. We started it during COVID. Uh, some folk have asked me to maybe quit it so people would come back to church. <laughs> well, I, I think we live in a different age now. We have a family in Florida. If y'all are watching today, be sure and put a note that we're there. We have a family in Florida that watches us frequently. I know of a couple of people up in Somerville that are watching it, families. Uh, there are people around, and you can encourage others to do it too. It's on YouTube. Uh, if you go to YouTube, you can look for my name, Jack Womack, and you can subscribe, and then YouTube will actually notify you every time one's posted. You can go to Facebook, the Hope Community page, and fact, Hope Community United Methodist Church page. There's a lot of Hope Communities in Facebook, and you can uh, like that, and you'll also get notified when they come out. And then it's also on our private Hope Community Connect page. Uh, it's in all three of those places every week. Uh, and and uh, it's just a part of what ministry is now. I, my friend uh, or acquaintance uh, uh, up in Leewood, Kansas, Adam Hamilton, has about 20,000 people in worship, but he has about 30,000 watching him online. And so you, you don't, if you're out of town, you can still be in church. Uh, but it is useful to put a domino on there and say, you know, now I'm not talking about me, just, you know, we enjoy the service or we're glad to see everybody or whatever. Uh, we're never going to turn it around and aim it at all of y'all so they don't know who's here or not, but uh, we welcome their attendance that way. Uh, I would invite you now to sing with us as we sing Rescue the Perishing. And when we get to the last verse, AJ will ask you to stand.
Reading from the Gospel of Luke, the 14th chapter. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of the leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you're not invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at a place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. Then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves shall be humbled, and those who humble themselves shall be exalted. He also said to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you may be seated. So Proverbs is where Jesus got the message. Don't sit in the most important place. You know, my observation in doing this job for a while, or calling, as some would say. <laughs> doing this task for a while is that new people typically come in and sit in the back. Sometimes seasoned people sit in the back too, but usually a newcomer is going to sit in the back because they're afraid they would take somebody else's seat. Now some people like to sit closer up, and so frequently if I'm milling around before church and a new person is here, they'll say, is it okay for me to sit here? We don't have reserved seats. In the old days, people bought a pew because the church couldn't afford to provide them, and people thought they owned that pew. And they would decide who was going to sit in that pew. That wasn't just in the Methodist church, that was in lots of churches. It actually, it's part of the reason the Free Methodist Church was born. But it seems to me that there is a message here about why we do what we do. I remember in 2008, uh, we had the, the church had very few people and we didn't have much activity. In fact, there was no activity. And so I got the YMCA to come over here and do an after school program. And one of the saints of the church looked at me and said, well, how many of those people are gonna come to church? Well, I said, probably not. Well, then why would we do it? That's a common thread when we look at stuff. When I was in the marketing director business and I would pay money for advertising, I was asked, I was told, you can pay whatever you want for advertising as long as you return threefold whatever you spent. So I went around and bought billboards around town, telling people how to get to where we were. And they were expensive, some over $1,500 a month, some over $2,500 a month, one of them over $225 was a little bit more than that. And I had to account for, in the, in the calls we got, the inquiries we got, and so forth and so on, that they were reaping rewards. The church didn't like that. We do what we do out of God's amazing grace. We provide what we do here for anybody that wants to come. Now, the problem with that is that anybody doesn't know they're invited. Oh, we can tell them. We can put a sign up that says everyone's welcome. But you know, somebody's going to drive by there and say, yeah, they don't mean me. Who would that be? Well, it might be the more sinful people in our community. The people that have some notion that they've gone so far away from God that God can't help them, doesn't want to help them, doesn't care about them. 
We just sang about it. Rescue the perishing. Care for the people that are lost. Care about the people out there in the world. Let me tell you, there's a lot of them available to be here right now. I venture to say not one of you had a traffic jam on the way to church today, except maybe Kim, who tried to come across the toll with the, the, the 610 bridge. Which, by the way, is not the way to go anywhere today because we found it yesterday. <laughs> they had it closed. But there's always a fine line. You know, what Jesus says here through the Scripture is, is those that are exalted will be put down, that exalt themselves will be put down low. Those that are humble will be exalted. And I want to tell you, there is a thin, fine line between humility and pride. And I've heard people often say, well, you know, preacher, we shouldn't tell people what we're doing because that's pride. Let me tell you, it is pride when we care for the needy. When we provide that blessing box out there, it's a great thing we do. Do some people take advantage of it? Maybe. That's on them, not us. We're caring for those that need it. Eleven kids went to Bill Nash's Champions Kids Camp this year because we cared enough to help them. Kids that live in, in foster homes and don't have an opportunity. And who knows that one of them may decide their life has turned around and have hope for the future. And they'll go somewhere to, to a college and, and then maybe they'll, you know, make it past that to some graduate degree. And maybe they'll be the heart surgeon or the, the brain surgeon or whatever that saves one of our lives. Everybody deserves an opportunity to be saved. Jesus did come for just the Methodists. I know that's distressing to some of us, but He didn't. He didn't come for just the Lutherans. He didn't come. In fact, He didn't even come for just the Christians. He came to save the world. I have a, an acquaintance. His name is Allison Cambry. Uh, Allison, I'm not going to try to quote you, dude. So if you're watching this, you're way smarter than me. But he, he was talking about the way we understand Jesus and the way we understand the Trinity. And nobody in all of the generations of Christian families has ever fully understood the Trinity. But it is the heart of our faith. It is what we believe. And if we read the creeds, any one of the creeds, the one we did today starts off with, the, with God. It goes into Jesus Christ and ends with the Holy Spirit. They're all like that. The Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. That's exactly what they do. They talk to us about the Trinity. And really what we understand about Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, is that He is the face of God. And so there's a lot of stuff in the Bible. We could go into the Old Testament. We could find Ten Commandments. Everybody could give us most of them. And then the Jews were so afraid that somebody would break one of the ten, they made 613 other laws. And they were rule bound. And we want to live there. We're much more comfortable being rule bound because we know when we're right and when we're wrong. And Jesus comes along and He says all you need is to love, the, love your God with your heart, your soul, and your might. And do unto others as you'd have to do unto you. Love others as I love you. It was a huge transition in the way that faith was seen. From having an unseeable, unknowable, mysterious in a cloud or a pillar of fire God. A God that only spoke to the certain people. To a God that came and did ministry to everyone. More especially to the outcasts. Oh, they didn't like him for it. They didn't care for him because he was interfering with the power structure. He was telling people the same thing John Wesley did when he, he you know, John Wesley, he, he was no different than the rest of us. He grew up as an Anglican. He lived in the Anglican world. And he was a, an educational zealot. He knew a lot of stuff. He could convert Hebrew to Greek and Greek to Hebrew by the time he was in fourth grade. He was a really smart guy. And he said, you know, faith is only administered to people in the church. I grew up with that idea. It was only in the church. And a guy named George Whitfield said, you know, John, 
You're organized. I need your organization because I'm preaching to these people in Bristol that work in the coal mines and their owners of those coal mines think those people have no value. And John went and started to tell them that every one of them had value. That, that no matter what their status in life was, they had value to God. You want to know how we do this? How we reach out to the, the poor and the penniless and the, the people in prison and the people that are sick and the people that are on the margins? We do it by caring. We care about people even when nobody else does. And there's enough of us Christians if we would get past some of these rules of being rule bound that if we would just join together around the, the empty tomb, the risen Christ, if we would join together around a Trinitarian view that says God the Creator made it, Jesus shows us how to live, the Holy Spirit will give us the strength to do it, if we would join with our brothers and sisters who believe that too, we could change the world. Now there's a lot of people that are pessimistic about the church. I go to a lot of preacher meetings. Attendance is down. A lot of people are thinking, well, the church has served its time. Not me. I think this is the time when the country, the community, this neighborhood needs the church. I think our future is very bright if we're optimistic and hopeful about what Jesus teaches us. If Jesus is for us, who could be against us? Amen. If Jesus has instructed us to be the church, not to be Hope Community United Methodist Church, to be the church, the church is the people. Yep. We've been commanded to love one another. We've been commanded to do unto others as we'd have them do unto us. So Jesus gives this parable. It's kind of an interesting parable. If you've been to a wedding, you know the drill. You, in the, especially in the old days, you come into the door, there's an usher usually there that says, are you with the bride and the groom? And then you get seated on the left or the right. And, or sometimes even at funerals, we'll say, well, are you a family member or not? Because the family used to be you know, set aside over on the side. Nowadays, family usually sit in the front. And we reserve seats for them. And, and so people come, and sometimes there's a question, am I really family or not? Do I really get to sit there? Or, or do I really like the bride more than the groom? Or maybe I don't like either one of them over here because they invited me to a wedding once and I feel like I need to come. This scripture kind of fits into our lives or where we are. Do you remember? Oh, I do. I remember so clearly when it got to be high school and college graduation time. We had to go through this long list of people that we had sent presents to so we could send an invitation to them so they could send a present back. <laughs> Maybe our family's the only one that had to deal with that. But I'm suspecting that when people start to do their wedding lists and their other stuff, they're going through, well, you know, oh, Granny, she always sends a nice gift. We better invite her. <laughs> and, you know, if, if we're doing ministry for what we're going to get out of it, then we've missed the point. The ministry we do is because we get something out of helping those that can't help themselves. One of the great strengths of the United Methodist Church is UNCOR. The United Methodist Committee on Relief. If you haven't ever studied it, looked at it, go home and Google it. See what we do. When the Rita Katrina stuff hit East Texas and Louisiana over that part of the world, Rita, the UNCOR was not the first group to get there, but they were still there two years later helping people after FEMA money ran out, after all of the governmental help went out. The FEMA, the, the UNCOR people were still there providing and helping rebuild houses to do what was necessary. Ukraine. When that thing started in Ukraine six months ago, this last week, I believe, when that started over there, UNCOR was there. Helping people get out of the country, helping people find a safe place, helping churches provide refuge. Sometimes we don't know how much we're doing by being in this connectional church. As always, growing up, you know, I always heard, well, you know, they can have big, bigger Baptist churches and more attendance because they don't have to pay apportionments. Yeah. Let me tell you. Paying apportionments is one of the greatest privileges we have. The benefits are huge. 
We have a connection with people. I, and right now, I chair the finance committee for the district. We actually have funds set aside for in case there's a church that the pastor gets sick and we need to provide a pastor for them. That doesn't happen in a congregational or independent church. We have funds set aside for one of our churches down in Texas City. They lost their air conditioner and, and they didn't have the money to fix it. They, they were trying, they had some money and we had the money to subsidize them because of churches like ours that paid 100% of their portion. Sometimes we've even had money to help people outside of that. I remember in uh, 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 Channel View, the church over there has a carport, port cachet, whatever word you want to use to describe that. And it's there on the edge of the freeway on Interstate 10. And these big box trucks kept driving through it. Three times in one year they drove through it and crashed into their building. And they had, you know, their deductible was there. And then they had all the other issues plus the repairs three times. And we had the money. We just sent them some money and said, help fix your roof. Because we're connected with each other. We care about each other. So many times it feels isolated in ministry. Sometimes it feels pretty lonely to be if you're all by yourself. And, and maybe sometimes the preacher has to start off remembering this, this scripture is true. Jesus said, I'm going to be with you. And I believe he's with this church and I believe he's with every church that first understands that the Lord is king. We start there and we move from that into the ways that God calls us to serve. And we don't hold up a big flag that says we gave more than anybody else. But we hold up a flag that says if you're hurting, we care. If, you, if you've got family members that are hurting, we care. If you've got friends that are hurting, we care. We want to know about them. We want to pray for them because if we can't do anything else, we can pray. And let me tell you, prayer works. Amen. I had the chance when Mac was in the hospital to pray with him. And he said, I'm praying every day, preacher. I said, I know you are, but let me pray with you because I want to be the representative of this group of people to let you know that we're all there praying for you. You're not in this alone. And neither are any of us. Jesus' gift to us, this face of God, is that we can see what it looks like. If, 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 if we're suffering, we've got to know what it's like. Anybody in here has experienced suffering. It may not be exactly the same, but it's still suffering. And we know what it's like to wake up in the morning and not know how you're going to make it through the day, either because of your health or because of finances or because of mental issues where you're just depressed. And we know, because we, we that tradition, scripture, reason, stuff, we know that some of those things are overcome by community. One of the young men that visits us on Saturday night right now, his mother's in a nursing home. One of the, you know, this always happens if you have somebody that's in the hospital or has a caregiver. There was a particular nurse that just reached out more than the others. It meant so much to her. That nurse committed suicide. And my friend was saying, you know, if I'd have just known that she was hurting, she was doing such a great job. If I'd have just known she was hurting, maybe there's something I could have said. And I want to tell you, and those of us that, that you know, uh, have, have friends that have been in the military, that are coming home from Afghanistan or wherever, and, and having PTSD, they've been taught to put on a good front. And us guys, we've been taught not to share our feelings. We've been taught we're the man of the house. We're strong. We can always be okay. We can't always be okay. And somewhere we've got to be able to, to let that go and let it out and talk about it. But more than that, we've got to be in a place where it's okay to talk about it. When I came here in 2008, we had a family in the church who had had a daughter murdered and had a son in prison. It wasn't talked about much. I don't know how long it took until they came to me and told me about it. But it was mostly because I was willing to stand up here and say, oh, by the way, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I've had issues in my life. Praise God. Thank God I don't have those issues today. I've been working on them for a long time. 
But it doesn't differentiate from me from somebody that's having them still today. Next week on the 1st of September, praise God, if I don't drink between now and then, I'll have 33 years sober. Awesome. You know, that's a cool thing. But it only gives me the opportunity to witness to people that you can get you can get through, you can make it. Those people that have been through hard times in their life have something to share. There are people in our world today that don't understand interest or credit cards or how to manage their money, but there's people in this room and in every Christian family that have been doing it for years. I was talking to the pastor up in Somerville uh, probably Friday, and she said, you know, we've got all these kids in the community, you would never believe this, but they don't know how to work a washing machine or a microwave or cook. Maybe what God's leading them in that ministry to do is to take all of these grandparents that they have visiting the church every week and use some of that talent to connect with the community and teach them things that they aren't learning at home. Now, we can make a social judgment, say they ought to be learning at home, but you know we live in the real world. Some of the kids aren't. But maybe we can make a difference. I, I know Robert was a part of How many years did host Robert? 27. Yeah, you know, host was an interesting thing, helping one student to succeed. It did not spend a lot of time always reading. What it did was it created a connection between a grown-up that was doing okay with kids that were just learning how to do okay. We need more of that. More interaction with the people that are hanging out out there not knowing where they're going. I don't think hardly anybody really knows what they want to be when they grow up, when they get out of high school. Now, I think they might think they know. I was pretty sure I knew. My mother thought I should be a school teacher. I was pretty sure that wasn't what I was supposed to be. After I nearly flunked out my first semester of elementary ed, I was pretty sure that wasn't what I was supposed to be. <laughs> I thought I was going to be an economist, so I, I, uh, I took economics. And I failed that too. So I learned that what I needed to do was figure out a way to get to the future. And so I, they had to think called the Law Enforcement Assistance Education Program. They said, if you'll be a policeman and work for four years after you graduate from college, we'll pay for your education. I said, sign me up. About four years into being a cop, I figured out this isn't where I want to live my life. But it was sure valuable experience to help me move on to the next thing. I was 51 years old before I answered the call to ministry. I floundered around a lot. I wasn't sure where I was headed or where I was going. And you know what? For the first time in, in, in 2002, two three, when I went to work for the church, I had a mission and a ministry that fit what I think God called me to do. But it wasn't what I expected. I thought being an old guy getting into ministry, they'd send me to some little old church up there in East Texas that had about six members. That's what I expected. Or they would send me to a big church where because of my experiences with alcoholism and so forth, they would send me to do pastoral care all the time. But you see, Bishop, whoever it was, Bishop Norris eventually, originally, and then the district superintendent and the church, they discerned what my gifts and graces were. And they put me into opportunities where I could grow into something. And I want to tell you, nothing has made me more proud of what we've done here but we're not done yet. I think our greatest days are yet to come. But we need to stay focused on the goal. That great preacher Paul, he took the church from a very secluded few people, the Jews, and they took it to the God-awful place called Samaria. And from Samaria to Rome. And from Rome to the world. Did it change? Well, sure. Remember, Peter thought everybody had to be circumcised. Paul said, well, that's not so much true. You can still do this. We spend an inordinate amount of time on a very few people that make bad decisions and claim that's the church. The predominance of churches are doing God's work. And we need to honor them and glorify them and help them do it, including this one. I don't think we should ever claim our spot in the front. 
In fact, I think we're going to be a much more successful and better church if we're always struggling just a little bit because that keeps us humble. And I'm pretty confident in Jesus' words, the humble will be exalted. I'm okay with that. Let's do what we have to do. Let's do what God calls us to do. Let's be the face of God for our community and for the world. Amen. How about it? Amen. Does that sound good? Amen. Does that sound like something we can do? Amen. Are we going to have to work at it? Yep. Sure. Will it be worth it? Yep. If only one. If only one <coughs> comes into the kingdom because of what we do, there will be a great celebration in heaven. Amen. Only one. Let's pray. God, we know that you've been our help in ages past, but more importantly, we know that you're our hope in the days to come. Give us the strength. To let go of the things that don't work. To let go of the things we think are the thing. And to remember that you are the thing that makes the thing the thing. Give us grace. But most of all, let us be graceful and merciful in the work that we do. It's in the name of God the Father. God the Son. And God the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen. So as you're able, would you stand as we sing God of grace and God of glory. We were so happy to welcome our newest member last week. She's still here. If you didn't say hi to her last week, she'll have a chance to say hi today. We're always ready to welcome new people into membership. Friends, let's sing together God of grace and God of glory. God of grace and God of glory. self to us. Jesus came to show us what God looks like. And friends, the Holy Spirit will be with us now as we go out to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.